So if I could interrupt your enjoyable and delicious lunch. So I hope you have enjoyed lunch and please continue and finish and enjoy your dessert. But we would like to get started with our program. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, former governor of Minnesota, Tim Pawlenty. Governor Pawlenty is chief executive officer of the Financial Services Roundtable, which seeks to protect the security, integrity, and success of our nation's financial system. And I know firsthand for many of the leading bankers in our country, they're very grateful for his efforts. He grew up in South St. Paul. He has political science and law degrees from the University of Minnesota. He worked as a labor law attorney and executive at a software company and became involved in government as a member of the Egan Planning Commission and Egan City Council. He was elected to the Minnesota House in 1992 and the House Republicans selected him as their majority leader in 1998. Just a short four years later, he was elected our governor and he won re-election in 2006. His education, healthcare, and energy initiatives were viewed as among the most innovative in our country. And among the many positions he held during his two terms, he also was chairman of the National Governors Association. Governor Pawlenty did not seek re-election in 2010. People are still trying to get him to do that. And he later served as co-chair of Mitt Romney's 2012 campaign for president. He is married to Mary Palenti, a former judge, and they have two daughters, Anna and Mara. Please join me in a warm welcome for Governor Tim Palenti. Well, good afternoon. It is a delight to be with you. When Lyndon Baines Johnson was president of the United States, he was in the cabinet room and Bill Moyers, who's had uh, some close connections to Minnesota and to St. Paul, was working in the Johnson administration at the time. And he asked Bill Moyers at the end of the table in the cabinet room to say a prayer before the meeting started. Bill Moyers did, but he did it softly. And LBJ, in sort of his typical bellicose manner, said, you know, we can't hear you at the, this end of the table. And Bill Moyers humbly said, it's not you that we, I was talking to. So Father Snyder, thank you for starting our gathering today with a blessing, and thank you to St. Thomas for continuing to uphold the value of recognizing and appreciating our Creator God and taking time to pray at the beginning of this gathering. That's wonderful, and we appreciate you being here. Father, President Sullivan, thank you for your spectacular leadership of this transformative leading university. I think your guidance, your leadership has made a huge difference. They always say that organizations over time take on the tempo and cadence and personality of their leadership. I'm sorry you have to work with such difficult board members, but um, <laughs> you know, the state of Minnesota and all of your students and the alumni network owes you a debt of gratitude for your service and your leadership of this wonderful institution. And thank you for your kind introduction as well. Um, I wanna talk to you today about uh, what's coming next in automation and the fourth industrial revolution and the like. But before I do, I just wanna step back from that and talk to you about the headaches or worries, anxieties, hopes, inspiration of our country. And there's a lot going on that gives people either hope or worry, and I won't get into the details of all of that, but if you just think about the incredible hand that the United States of America has been dealt, we are a very blessed nation. And so we live in the freest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. There is no people anywhere ever that have lived in a more free, more prosperous, more successful country than those of us fortunate enough to live in the United States of America in these times. We are indeed blessed. Think about this country. If you were to put a country anywhere on the globe geographically that you could and you could pick where to plop it down, You'd plop it down knowing what we know now, right about where the United States of America is. We have protections on both sides of us in the form of the Atlantic and specific, uh, Pacific Oceans that give us incredible abundance by being next to coastlines and all that the oceans bring. Uh, but we also have incredible buffers around us. We have neighbors to the north and to the south, 
namely Canada and Mexico, and we have some issues with them, but generally they are free, they are democratic, they are friendly, we benefit mightily from our friendship and our interaction both commercially and otherwise and politically with those two great neighbors. We have the best and most effective military the world has ever known and will continue to have that as long as we have the strongest economy the world has ever known. Our markets in the United States of America are deep and liquid and they are the envy of the rest of the world. They're transparent, they're based on the rule of law. Our nation is based on the rule of law, not on the rule of men or women or people who are autocrats or dictators. We have the finest university system in the world still by far. The rest of the world continues to envy it, send their best and brightest here to study, and we should continue to encourage that. Uh, we also have, of course, the most innovative and creative people in the world in terms of arts and culture and technology. Our economy is still the biggest in the world, and the list goes on and on. So we have so many blessings, we have so many advantages, we have so many assets. If as a people, whether you're R or D or independent or something else or nothing, if we could just get some common consensus around a few basic things, uh, we're gonna have a great future. And the list is not that hard, and frankly, it shouldn't, isn't even that long. And again, that's not the purpose of my speech today, but I hope that we all start with the premise of we have an incredible advantage, an incredible blessing, and this is a great country, and it will continue to be great if we do a few wise things. One of the things I wanna to talk to you about, and it's just one on that list, is what's coming next in terms of our economy as the so-called fourth industrial revolution continues to set in. And so I think all of you know the first industrial revolution was, of course, the advent of steam and the steam power and the steam engine. The second industrial revolution was, is generally marked by the concurrent advent of electricity and the internal combustion engine. The third industrial revolution is marked by the advent of the internet, particularly the effects of the internet in the 1990s and subsequent. And now we are at the doorstep, the dawn of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. And that industrial revolution is what's coming next in terms of next generation, transformative, quantum, exponential capabilities in technology. Certainly includes new developments in nanotechnology. It certainly includes new developments in terms of biomedical technology. And, but importantly, and perhaps most importantly, it's what's coming with respect to the application of what's known as artificial intelligence combined with machine learning applied to our daily lives, particularly in terms of commercial sectors. So I spoke the other day and, and talking about AI and somebody said, is that artificial insemination? Um, <laughs> no, it, it, well, that's also artificial insemination. But it, it is artificial intelligence. And for those of you who may not follow this at the level of the uh, engineers and the like, artificial intelligence, there's really nothing artificial about it. This is the work product of very smart, very diligent people who have put together algorithms that can consume and monitor massive amounts of data instantly, then discern patterns in the data and predict and anticipate what's gonna happen next. And then as that evolves, the machine teaches itself. So at some point after the original programming and oversight of it, the machine begins to learn on the patterns as it self-corrects to the point where the machine begins to operate essentially autonomously or semi-autonomously. That's an oversimplified for purposes of brevity description, but that is what's taking place and it's about to explode in ways that are gonna be extremely promising, but also extremely disruptive. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You know in our country, one of the biggest challenges that we have is the healthcare crisis. And it takes on many forms. Some people say, well, the healthcare crisis is really about access. We need everybody to have access to a healthcare delivery system. It's certainly true. There's others who say, you know, we need uh, to solve the healthcare crisis because of cost. It's just too expensive. That's certainly also true. And then there's others who say, wait a minute, it can't just be about access and cost. 
It also has to be about quality. We want to make sure that the services we receive remain and improve at a high quality level. All true. So access, cost, quality sort of defines some of the measurements and parameters around the healthcare debate. Well, what if in the future, or say in a year, the access question in part is solved by this? Now, there is no one in the room who doesn't have one of these. I spoke to somebody this morning who just spent a lot of time in Kenya. And this person was there for an extended period of time. And I said, you know, based on your travels and interactions, how many people in Kenya had smartphones? He said, all of them. Everybody I met. Everybody I met. So what does that mean in terms of health care? What does it mean in terms of the future of our economy? If I told you that your phone can or soon will be able to take your pulse, you'd say, well, you know, it's mildly interesting. I can take my own pulse. I said, well, OK, what if we had a very inexpensive a cord or perhaps even just Bluetooth connection to a blood pressure cup, uh, and it could take your blood pressure whenever you wanted. You'd say, that, that's a little more interesting, OK. Now, how about if you could plug something in, or again, with a Wi-Fi connection, just put your fingers on the screen, and it would run an EKG of your heart. Now, that gets a little more interesting, doesn't it? Uh, what if in the not-too-distant future for free you could take your own MRI or your own ultrasound of your own organs and I could hold my phone over my uh, pancreas or my kidneys and my stomach or my neck, my carotid artery on my neck, and I could take those images at levels of accuracy and precision that exceed today's standard of an ultrasound or an MRI? You say, now that's getting even more interesting. What if I could spit on my phone and the saliva readout on my phone could tell me all kinds of things about my genetics and medical condition? Getting more interesting, isn't it? And what if I could bleed on my phone? What if I could prick my finger and put a drop of blood on my phone and I could run a blood test from my breakfast table? That gets a lot more interesting. What if my phone and my mattress could talk to each other in the IoT, the Internet of Things, and your mattress can tell you whether you slept how long, whether you were tossing and turning, how much perspiration you threw out in the night, uh, what your medical kind of readings were during the night, and that all got aggregated on the phone. You get the idea. This goes on and on. So let's talk about access. Everybody's got one, right? Total access. Doesn't, increasingly doesn't even cost that much. Well, what about um, quality? Hmm. Well, quality, sorry, I kicked over the flowers. Uh, we'll set those over here. Uh, you know, access, cost, and quality. The cost of what I just described to you at scale is going to be dramatically less, a fraction of what it is being charged in the current system, a fraction. The cost will plummet. And some of these things are already coming to market. But what about quality? Well, quality. Now, we love the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota and all of our wonderful health care providers in this state. But the health care crisis is probably not going to be solved substantially by government, probably isn't going to be substantially solved by insurance companies or even other private companies. It's going to be solved in large part or substantial part by technology. So what does AI and machine learning have to do with that? There are 10,000 known medical conditions. Humans know about 10,000 medical conditions. Your highest trained doctor, your most well-read doctor, no matter how diligent they are, no matter how experienced they are, are incapable of knowing more and remembering more than just one or 200 conditions out of 10,000. But here's what's happening. Watson, IBM's supercomputer, first in the area of oncology, but soon in other areas, other platforms, namely a company like called Babylon out of the UK, are using a quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to load into their database every medical journal written, and as soon as it gets published, absorbed in, every piece of medical and scientific knowledge and development known in the world that's relevant in modern times, and every time something new comes out, it gets put into the system, 
And when you go to the doctor currently, what happens? Unless you have an acute condition, the vast majority of doctor's visits are around, you know, how do you feel? They take a look at you. By the way, these phones now can scan your skin, scan your face, see if you've got an abnormal mole, zoom in on the mole. They can be a dermatologist for you. You can scan your legs, whatever you want to do. That's coming soon as well. But mostly what doctors do, I'll take your blood pressure, I'll take your heart rate, uh, I'll take your cholesterol, I might do a genetic test, I might do an imaging screen, I'll run an EKG, and then in many, not all instances, the result of that is the doctor makes an assumption, a diagnosis about what's wrong with you, and most often prescribes a medicine. Watson and Babylon are going to be able to do that and already are in certain areas at a rate that far exceeds human accuracy and diagnosis. There are 40,000 people in this country that die every year in ICU, intensive care units, uh, because of misdiagnosis or delayed correct diagnosis. And it gets worse as you get out of the ICUs. So as you think about Babylon and you think about Watson, you could take all of the knowledge that the Mayo Clinic has and have it instantly available in a AI-driven machine learning uh, platform that equals the knowledge of the Mayo Clinic and make it available instantly worldwide. So let's say my friend Chris Georgicus here is at home. He has an ailment and he doesn't want to call the doctor's office, wait a month to have an appointment, get in his car, drive over to the university, park in a remote lot, chug over to Phillips Wagenstein building, sit in the room with other sick people, uh, go see the doctor, they're in a hurry, they're kind of hassled. So what might Chris do? Chris might just run all the tests right from his kitchen table that I just described to you. It can be instantly uploaded to uh, a Watson or Babylon-like platform. The diagnosis can come in seconds and a drone will fly to Chris Georgicus' house in Stillwater and drop the prescription in his driveway in 15 minutes. In 15 minutes. That is an example, and it is not Star Trek. It is not, you know, some freaked out scenario. These are all technologies. These are all capabilities that are being brought to market or will be brought to market shortly. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to change the need for doctors. Their role will change, but it is going to change access. It's going to change cost and it'll probably uh, change quality, probably for the better. So that's one sector, and I won't go on, but I want to give you a few others. My sector that I work in, the president mentioned I work in financial services currently as the CEO of the Financial Services Roundtable. I was with a gentleman the other day in Atlanta who founded something called Green Sky. And Green Sky is a company that has gotten between uh, Home Depot and contractors and consumers around financing for home remodeling projects and the model is soon going to be expanded out to uh, other entities. By the way, this is a valuation of $4 billion company that was worth zero, you know, 18 months ago. Um, and Green Sky can do this. If Eric wants a loan because he's remodeling his bathroom and he's talking to his contractor and he expresses some anxiety about, you know, the, the project and how he's going to pay for it, the contractor who was pre-certified and involved in this Green Sky program can take a picture of Eric's driver's license and the loan can be approved in one second. One second. So how many of you are going to drive to a bank on a Saturday morning, sit in the lobby, have some you know, person interrogate you in a cubicle so the rest of your neighbors can hear about your financial condition, uh, fill out a bunch of paperwork, sit around the bank branch, take two hours of your time to mess with that, or a mortgage for that matter. Good Lord, that's a headache. Uh, or in the future, are you thinking, I think it's just easier to push a button on my phone and take a picture of my driver's license. How can they do that? They can do that because some people have aggregated massive amounts of data into databases and a machine can tell you a heck of a lot about Eric. There's lots of privacy issues here and other issues as well very quickly. So this is in large part, it won't replace banks because there's still needs for them, but obviously this is going to change that sector as well. Let me give you one other example. 
uh, cashiers, tellers, uh, all kinds of things. And people say, well, gosh, you know, uh, I think you're going to hear from my friend Pat Ryan, right? He's coming to speak at this in a few weeks. I said, well, can something like construction, you know, could that change? It is all going to change. So you've heard about 3D printing. Most of you know what that is, but people think, well, it's going to replace manufacturing because there's going to be some factory and they're going to use 3D printing. They're going to make these little plastic widgets and manufacturing is kind of getting automated substantially anyhow. So that, that's interesting, but it's not that interesting. What if you could 3D print a building? What if you could 3D print a house? So 3D printing, you know, they have these sprayers, compounds get fed into the sprayers, they mix at the point of application, and they can build almost anything. China just built a high-rise, a commercial high-rise in a beta test with 3D printing. I'm going to show you a video in just a second of a house being 3D printed, and the house can get 3D printed in less than 18 hours for less than $10,000. So imagine, you think about, well, what about affordable housing? My friend Gene Fry and his family and the Fry Foundation have put in lots of money into how do we help make progress on affordable housing? How are we going to get people at the margins of society better housing situations? Well, what if on a vacant lot you could roll up a robot arm, which you'll see in just a second, and build a house with essentially no human involvement in 18 hours for less than $10,000? It changes everything in the construction market and this sector uh, so let's watch this video. Less than 18 hours, $10,000. They're working on a compound that they can extract carbon out of the atmosphere, feed it into one of those machines, apply it, and build buildings out of a carbon fiber material that is 10 times stronger than steel. And pennies, it costs pennies to produce it. So what does that mean for affordable housing? What does that mean for construction? What does that mean for certain elements of the skilled trades? And by the way, uh, you still need plumbers and people to do the window frames and the electricians, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. I won't go on and on, but you also heard about autonomous vehicles, because I want to get to the workforce part of this. Everybody's like, okay, I get the deal with driverless cars, they're coming. There are four million people in the United States of America who make a living driving. Taxi cab, Uber, trucks, Driving, four million people directly. So there's another four million people who support those drivers in terms of dispatching, logistics, communications, administration, and the like. So we have a country of 330 million people, and if you control for senior citizens and you control for children, we have about, you know, give or take, 200 million people in the workforce. So driving alone and the people directly connected to driving, you're talking about eight million jobs all at risk in the next five to 10 years. And people say, well, it's gonna come slowly, it's coming a lot faster than you think. And then people say, well, that's interesting, autonomous cars, you know, uh, it's gonna change a lot, you know, we don't need all this fixed capacity sitting out in the parking lot, you can have these autonomous cars drop us off at St. Thomas, they'll come back and pick us up later this afternoon, in the meantime, they don't, we don't need all this fixed capacity sitting in the parking lot, in the parking garage. What if you had flying cars? We have this debate about, should we have fixed light rail? Should we have more dedicated bus lines? He said, flying cars, Palenti has lost his mind. Uh, I haven't lost my mind. I'm going to show you a video of a flying car that's going to be beta tested in Dubai later this year. It has 38 independent engines. It's a solar-powered car. It has vertical uh, takeoff and landing capabilities. It'll go well over 100 miles an hour. It will hold two people. It is fully autonomous. You can summon it like Uber on your iPhone. It will land within a defined space the size of a parking space out in the parking ramp, 
and at scale they believe they're going to be able to bring it to market for less than a average price American sedan. And this is a German company, this is a real product, and it is going to be beta tested this fall. And you think it'll change transportation? So you have um, an airplane that takes off vertically like a helicopter. But once it's in the air, it accelerates into forward flight and flies with wingborne lift. And this way it achieves much higher speeds than cars, but also higher speeds than a helicopter. So connectivity is what it's all about. So think about that. For the price of a car, you get that. And by the way, deconflicts relative to other things in the airspace, you don't need a pilot. So I, I want to transition to workforce. Um, but again, the positives here are productivity is going to go through the roof. Uh, precision is going to go through the roof. Access is going to go through the roof. Cost is going to decline. Leisure is going to increase. And if you haven't yet tried virtual reality goggles, and they're in, in this primitive form now, so it's very primitive. But imagine in the future, if you're watching the Vikings, not from the 40, 50 yard line at a 45 degree angle with a camera down on the field, but what if there were micro cameras in the field and they popped up in 360 degree abilities and you sitting in your living room at home with virtual reality goggles on and you're in the game. I mean, Adrian, well, not Adrian Peterson anymore, uh, not Delvin Cook anymore, Latavius Murray. I mean, you're in the huddle with Bradford and Latavius Murray because there's a camera right at toe height that pops up and down, and your vantage point of watching the game is not from somebody in the stands. You're sitting virtually on the 50-yard line. That's coming. They're working on that. You go to uh, New Delhi or you, know, you go, go to uh, anywhere in the world using these virtual reality goggles. So the good part is all of that, by the way, on the, on the leisure side, this gets to the work side. The negative side, massive disruption. Massive disruption to the positive and to the negative. So Forrester says 6% of all the jobs in the United States of America because of this kind of technology are going to be eliminated by 2021. Ball State said 88% of all the manufacturing jobs in the country lost in recent years were lost not because of foreign competition or trade, but because of automation. And that's about to take another quantum leap forward. The World Economic Forum says that 65% of children entering primary school today will be working in jobs that don't yet exist when they graduate from school. 65% of the kids entering school today will work in jobs that don't even yet exist. And Oxford came out with a study just recently that said, 47% of all the jobs in the United States in gross terms will be eliminated within 20 years. Now there'll be lots of new jobs too and one of the raging debates is what's the net effect of all of this? The pessimists say the net effect is going to be so uh, displacing we got to have and you'll see voices already in Europe calling for this, you'll see Mark Zuckerberg's already called for this and, and frankly kind of the left side of the political spectrum calling for this minimum wage stipends because it's gonna have so many people so displaced that we have to have minimum wage stipends to quell the likelihood of social unrest and displacement. Another school of thought is we need to lean into what the new jobs are and prepare and stimulate for that. So what do we do about this? Well, first of all, um, we have to educate and raise awareness. So I'm spending my time in Minnesota trying to go around to groups like this saying, please be aware of this, number one. Number two, we have to ask our education leaders and their supporters, and this is at the K-12 level, it's at the vocational level, it's at the higher education level, and it's at the corporate training and retraining level. We need to have an acute understanding of the skills and abilities that go into inventing this, that go into maintaining this, that go into installing this, that go into monitoring this, to go into replacing it and make sure, to the fullest extent practical, our curriculum, our training, our education is aligned to what's going to be required, not 40 years ago, now, 
but for what's coming. Uh, that's one. Two is, three is, in the areas that can't be automated, we have to identify them and lean into them. The President and I were talking over lunch about, you know, there's going to be a bunch of jobs, particularly vocational training, that can't be outsourced. You know, electricians and plumbers, uh, uh, hospitality workers, and more are going to be in demand, and we should promote and celebrate every one of those jobs and make sure we quit talking down skilled trades and vocational jobs, and we shouldn't, and I, we don't, yeah. but some people do. But importantly, the emotional uh, and humility quotient around certain jobs, counseling, sociology, psychology, you know, the arts, the soft skills that some people say, oh, you know, liberal arts, you know, what do we need that for? Well, we need that because the stuff that machines can't do, uh, humans are going to have to do more of. So doctors, if, you know, diagnostic capabilities and tests are going to be increasingly done on an automated basis, doctors can increase their emotional quotient around counseling information, have more time to have a human connection. So the realm of human interaction Emotion, humility, and the like is going to be more important than ever. And I, I'll just uh, say we have to make sure that we aren't complacent. I want to play two more videos and then I'm going to get off the stage. Some people say, well, you know, this will never apply to the arts. I just threw this video in because I thought it was cute. They put a robot, Gene, I'm sorry for, because I know you love the, the symphony. They, they put a robot together that can now conduct a symphony better than a human. And they programmed. They programmed uh, this with not every you know, symphony yet, but this has now learned something like 1,200 uh, uh, pieces of work. And watch this video. And this actually happened in Europe. Basic for these. Absolutely fantastic. Watching Yumi while playing, I realized that it's very smooth. It's very smooth. You know, it's not a kind of metronome, but it really moves uh, and it gives something uh, uh, back, and it's very easy to follow it. Lastly, uh, Minnesota's biggest challenge, I should say one of Minnesota's biggest challenges, is complacency. So this is a state that has some of the highest graduation rates in the country, some of the best universities in the country, some of the best healthcare delivery system in the country, some of the most innovative companies in the country, one of the more diverse economies in the country, and there's a sort of a reflexive reaction in Minnesota to say, you know, we sort of just need to do what we've been doing and things will be fine. And it's not fully mindful enough of the need for change and the disruption that's coming. So I want to close by playing a video about complacency. And you know, at Google, they used to say, the future is awesome. And it will be if we can see this coming and we can do this educational inventory that I'm going to keep pushing for uh, in, in Minnesota. And it will be awesome for those people and places who see it coming get in front of it, align towards it, and they will prosper. Silicon Valley certainly will, but I want Minnesota to get its share and more of it. But we have a tendency towards complacency because we've had it pretty good. This is the former CEO of BlackBerry who owned the smartphone market at one time. And remember, 10 years ago, smartphones were nascent, weren't even around. Twitter wasn't around. Wikipedia wasn't around. YouTube wasn't around. Facebook wasn't around. Uh, Snapchat wasn't around 10 years ago, or they were in their nascent stages. So if you don't think things can happen rapidly, just look where technology was 10 years ago compared to today. Everything I just listed to you essentially didn't exist 10 years ago in 2007. I'll close with this lesson on complacency from the, one of the uh, dumbest business decisions and attitudes in American business history. The camera one. <laughs> How are things going? Things are really good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. excellent. excellent. As you imagine, um, I mean, all the things that have sort of changed in your life in the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, a lot less has changed than you would think, really. A very normal life, kind of 
it, it, it's just a whole lot more zeros on everything. Yeah. So. Which is great if the decimal point's in the right place, you know. Uh, the, the, I mean, where, where Rim has gone uh, in the last, like, you know, did you have a moment where you thought, okay, I think we, we've reached, like, we're here? You know, not a lot, really. I don't, I don't sort of think that way. I don't, I don't sort of look up too much. I don't look down too much. Uh, you know, I just, it's the great fun is doing what you do every day. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, not, I'm sort of a poster child for not sort of doing anything but what we do, uh, you know, every day. So... Um, no, I don't really think about it a lot, no. I mean, do you get the sense that at, at this point with what the BlackBerry itself, that device has done for your company, that it's a matter of time before other people, like the iPhone didn't really do it. I mean, like, do you ever look at it and go, what are we going to do if this isn't our primary business, growing rim beyond something like a BlackBerry? Mm, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly die. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll just be yeah, it. We're a very poorly diversified portfolio. <laughs> it's like, it's one thing. It either goes to the moon or it crashes to earth. So, uh, <laughs> nice. But it's making it to the moon pretty good. So, sure. so anyhow, we'll close with that. Uh, I think we're out of time, so I think we have to dispense with the qu questions. If you want to follow up with me, you can just Google me. I'm on the Internet. But my ask to you is you are all influencers, and congratulations on being alums of this terrific university. But in your communities, in your families, and, and more broadly, businesses and your other walks of life, you have a chance to think about all of this. But we have to, we cannot have a 1940s industrial, one-size-fits-all, educational system that is resistant to change, much less rapid change. It has to be transformed. It's going to take a lot of pushing. And teachers are wonderful. They're not overpaid. They work in an outdated system. And technology can play a role. But we have to ask our educational and training systems to align to this. And they need to do it rapidly. And they need to, un starting with understanding it. So that will come into focus as this gets inventoried. But then we need to have people who are willing to champion and advocate holding these institutions accountable for the change. So I thank you for listening to me. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And uh, thank you for taking this message in. <clears throat>Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It was fabulous. And thank you for that insightful glimpse into the near-term future <laughs> and uh, the near-term future that we are preparing our students for. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I want to also thank our platinum sponsor of the First Friday series, Minnesota Bank and Trust, our gold sponsor, the Executive Education Programs of the Opus College of Business, our season table hosts, and our Student Alumni Council volunteers. As Governor Palenti said, our next speaker is November 3rd, Pat Ryan, CEO of Ryan Companies and also the chair of our Board of Trustees at the University of St. Thomas. I'll make sure we've taped Governor Palenti's talk and I'll make sure uh, Pat has a chance to see it before he's here in November. Uh, you can register on the alumni website or talk to your table host. And again, thank you all for being here. Happy homecoming and happy reunion weekend. Enjoy yourselves.